Thank you very much, especially to Caroline Irshara. She's a PhD candidate at the Department of Linguistics at the University of Innsbruck with research interests in corpus and discourse studies and feminist linguistics. She was involved in several research projects uh, focusing on the connection between language and gender and is particularly interested in how this link affects medical discourses. In her doctoral project, by the way, submitted in May 2023, she worked on an extensive corpus of radiology reports by taking a critical medical humanities perspective. Currently, she is involved in a uh, Forschungsförderungsfonds uh, funded project uh, in the field of digital humanities at the University of Innsbruck, which is concerned with the semantic annotation of a historical corpus. Caroline, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you just a minute. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, so uh, thank you very much. I'm happy to share some of my PhD work with you. And my presentation is about gender bias in medical communication. I will give you some insights into a linguistic analysis of German radiology reports. And I would like to start uh, by giving you an idea of the motivation for this study. So uh, it actually started at the department of the radiology, um, at the radiology department of the Innsbruck University Hospital. As you can see here on this slide, um, some radiologists reached out to the linguistics department of the university where I work, and they had a gender related question. So their question was, um, they found out that uh, if you leave away all the uh, gender specific radiology examinations, for example, mammography or urology and so on, you generate lots of reports um, that, uh, and there is a so some sort of an imbalance in this amount of reports. They create much more reports for male patients than they do for female patients. Um, on the next slide, you can see uh, this plot, which should illustrate this imbalance on the basis of the percentages according to gender in some of the types of the uh, of examinations. For example, you have uh, CTs or um, X-rays, ultrasound examinations, and so on. And the bluish bars are is the amount of male patients, and the orange ones the, the amount for female patients. So there seems to be some sort of bias, and they do not really know why um, this is the case. Now, by bias, I do not mean something somebody actively does and on purpose or for base motives, but unconscious beliefs or presumptions of people based on gender or on other um, social factors. Such biases can be inflicted and reproduced by our language use. So the question is whether there is also some sort of bias which might be found on the linguistic surface of these data, may it be implicit or explicit. So that was their question. So can we find something that is might be related to uh, bias in these texts? Um, at this point, I might also stress that you can see we only have uh, two genders here. So I'm reproducing this binary uh, system while being aware that this is a large issue, but the data did not provide any other options. So we just have male or female patients. Now, some research questions are then, for example, um, are male and female patients discussed similarly or differently in these radiology reports? How are patients talked about in general? What other identity categories um, are made salient? Which, um, yeah, how uh, is this language used? Um, how is this language used when talking about people? Um, the basic premise of this research project is that um, I assume medical reports to be discursive linguistic events, which are influenced by social and institutional factors, and thus are a database which can be studied from a critical medical humanities perspective. So this means, um, critical medical humanities means that you try to link the humanities, the arts, also the social sciences, with the medical and life sciences to get a fuller picture of how illness and health um, is experienced and negotiated in society. So for example, not just to look only on the doctor patient setting, but also on how is health negotiated in, um, in politics or in media and so on. 
And the goal is usually to question, or one goal at least, is usually to question routines and norms of both medical and humanities disciplines. For example, the male patient as norm or the male person as norm. And I also assume that these uh, databases can be analyzed with a CATS apparatus. Um, by CATS, that's it's short for Corpus Assisted Discourse Studies. And these are studies which try to use corpora, so um, large samples of language data, which are linguistically annotated, to investigate a particular, particular discourse type. So, for example, if I want to analyze this medical discourse, I use a certain data set, which is deemed to be somehow representative um, of this discourse, but only, of course, to a certain extent. And then so-called quantitative and qualitative methods can be combined, and I will show you some examples for this um, later. Now, first, we have to take um, a quick look at what radiology reporting actually is. I'm sure you have your own experience with it, but um, so just to get a quick idea, I, um, it is a daily discursive medical practice. Um, and it works like this, a clinician uh, or a clinic, clinical professional decides which examination mode needs to be applied. For example, do I have to do a shoulder CT or an abdomen CT? You can see some uh, of the examples here on the left. Then the radiologist undertakes the examination and generates these images. You might be familiar with some of them, CTs, X-rays and MRIs and so on. And then what I am interested in is the third part, so the documentation process. And so the results are documented, they are described, and they're also interpreted. So for example, what can I see? Um, is there a certain pathological condition and maybe a fracture, a bleeding, so on, and which next steps should be undertaken? So it's crucial to know that um, they are a form of medical peer communication. So it's a form of communication from a radiologist to a referring physician who then decides what are the next steps um, to do. And um, another thing that might be interesting is that these texts also serve as a legal record documenting the imaging procedures. So it might happen that they are used in court as well. I mean, the, te the texts are from Austria. It might happen. I'm not sure how many times, but it, it can be. And um, now, Let's have a quick, another quick look at an example of such a report. I tried to translate it. It's just an extract of a cranial MCT. And so you can see what the data looks like. Uh, um, here on the top, you can see that there's lots of demographic and medical metadata. So for example, you have um, the patient's gender. I do not have the doctor's gender encoded, but the patient's gender, the age, the type of insurance, for example, and the occupation and so on. And then you have medical um, metadata, the weight um, or body heat and so on. And um, then this is the report text itself. The data I looked at, um, here you have a clinical indication. It's about sinusitis. And then you have the findings. Uh, let me just read through one line maybe. Um, findings are broad cushion shaped mucosal swelling um, at the base of the left maxillary sinus. Then you have uh, measurements, and then in the end, you have the statement what it might be or what it is. And so, for example, no mirror formations, no OCS destruction, destruction, and so on. So, the texts are usually very concise and they use a lot of medical terminology, and they might be described as very informative texts consisting of, of very similar text modules. Now, the data I looked at for today uh, is consisting. At, it's a part of my uh, PhD project, and it's consisting of uh, cranial, thoracic, and whole body CTs. And in total, I have more than 300,000 of uh, these texts, which, however, are extracted from a larger text corpus. So the, the whole corpus I created in this project amounts to 5 million of such unstructured um, radiology reports. But I always uh, had to choose some subcorpora because it was just so on the one hand, it doesn't make sense to compare, um, I don't know, a CT of the brain with uh, the left arm, for example. But uh, yeah, so I always had to choose thematically a consistent corpora in order to really be able to compare them. Uh, the time period is from 2007 until 2019. So it's, um, it's this time span and we have uh, collected all the reports that were uh, made in this um, time. 
So it is around 800 uh, reports per day in total. Um, and also here you can see that male patients do get more examinations. And um, yeah, so this is just the, the, the data I'm uh, talking about today. Now the texts are very standardized as they're um, produced in a highly institutionalized context. And so they use, make use of a very restricted and stable lexical um, repertoire. So um, you can measure, in corpus linguistics, you can measure the lexical diversity or um, richness, might be Wortschatz in German. Um, and you can see it is slightly, so first it is a bit stable, then it is decreasing over time. So here's the time span. And the higher the value is, the higher the lexical diversity is. And so I, for, for example, tried to add uh, gender as a categorical variable here, but as you can see, there are almost no differences. So um, there seems not to be um, a much higher lexical diversity in texts for women than uh, for men, which is to be expected because the texts are really standardized. I also looked for the text length. Um, and you also can you can see also um, in this um, from this perspective that the texts tend to get a bit shorter throughout time. So they use around 250 words per text um, and they tend to get a bit shorter. You see there's lots of outliers, but um, yeah, the, on the average it is uh, getting shorter. So um, this might also reflect this standardization that is being um, that is a, a trend or tendency in the data. So here you cannot really find uh, significant gender differences. I've always chosen just one subcorpus here, but it's the same in the others. And if there are significant um, uh, differences, they do not really have a strong effect. So um, then I tried um, to apply more um, of this CATS methodology with a focus on gender. And I just to quickly introduce one technique that I applied, it's keywording. Um, this is a very commonly used technique in corpus linguistics. And um, so it's uh, generating so-called candidate key items, which are lexical items that are typical for the radiology discourse I want to investigate in relation to the patient's gender. So it's, um, it's basically just it tells us something about one type of the data in comparison to another. So you always have to compare uh, something uh, in order to get to know uh, what one type of this or one part of the corpus is about. And I compared, uh, of course, reports on female patients and reports on male patients. I call them FCTs and MCTs. And then I did two types of uh, keyword extractions. So first I looked at keywords referring to persons. This um, idea is coming from the uh, discourse circle approach of discourse analysis, where you uh, look at how persons are talked about in discourses, for example, um, by Vodak and Eisigl. And I'm not going to talk about that on the right for now. Uh, but the second um, items that I extracted are potentially interesting items in terms of the research questions. And I'm not, uh, yeah. I'm leaving it here and uh, introducing you to this first, to these nouns referring to persons that I found. So um, also here, just quickly, um, there were only a few nouns referring to persons which can be found in the top 500 uh, keywords. This is of course, because the reports are more about body parts um, or bones, for example, for example, of people, but not so much about people themselves. So they are maybe not in the center of attention. Uh, in this in this text type, and I will now just talk about these two patient in the feminine and in the masculine form. So in German, you have the grammatical gender, so you can see that there's always a feminine and a masculine form being used. However, there are also many forms where you can see that for female patients, only the masculine form is being used as the so-called um, generic masculine. But I'm not going to talk about that uh, now. So what I tried to do was a close reading of all the occurrences of these two words in the corpus. So I just chose one corpus. Again, it is the um, whole body CT corpus. And I tried to look at so-called concordance lines. Um, concordance lines are lines where you have the node word, so the query word you want to look at, for example, a female patient. And then you can see the context of the word. So for example, you can 
uh, set it to 10 words to the left and 10 words to the right. And you can sort and play around with it. And it's a really uh, useful tool to really get to know your data and the discourses surrounding patients. And um, there were more than 8,000 lines each. So I was not able to categorize all of them in a very, in a very detailed fashion but I try to indicate some uh, of the percentages of the lines which, were a, which I was able to categorize in relation to all the concordance lines. So for example, patients are mentioned in the reports when they are giving consent to a specific examination, um, when they're being prepared for an examination, when they do not attend their appointments or when they refuse a treatment and so on. So it's basically um, very similar context in which they are used. And you can also see there are not many differences here again. So maybe at least the, yeah, the only thing is the appointments, but it's also not a, a large difference that men do seem to not attend their appointments a bit more often than, um, than women. <clears throat> but it seems in general that these texts are very similar and there are no overt uh, differences. So gender bias might not be found on the first glimpse. Then I tried to look also at concurrence lines, which are not that easily categorizable. And here I found some very interesting um, examples, and I'm just showing you two of them, but there would be some more. I tried to translate them with um, my new best friend, Deeple, and hope it's, it's more or less all right. Um, so in the first example, we have a follow-up that is requested, and then uh, there is a female patient, uh, which uh, is talked uh, who is talked about like an obese lady, and then it's added that she's small and broad. Thank you. And then we also have uh, difficile hominem, so a difficult person. So um, this was a bit surprising because I mean obesity is mentioned quite often because of this tube, and it seems to be somehow clinically uh, it seems to be clinically relevant uh, at times. But then it's mentioned again, so there's put a special emphasis on this woman's body, actually, which was not um, expected as the texts are very standardized. And then we also have this topos of women being especially difficult or complicated, um, which might influence the referring physician in their first impression of this person. So we have some influences of evaluative language, even if the texts in general are very standardized. Um, and maybe I should add that women are more often mentioned to be obese in general. And this is difficult to interpret because on the one hand, we don't know if this is really the case. It might be the case. Or is it just the case because women are not expected to be uh, obese and maybe it might be mentioned therefore more often. This is maybe something we can discuss later. Let's stay for uh, one more minute on this uh, more qualitative level. I found this um, uh, example, what, oh, sorry. <laughs> it says, um, it has a referral that there's some sort of diffuse pain and the patient, in this case, it's a, a male patient, is clinically poorly accessible and is suffering from South, so-called Southern nurse disease. I translated it like that. So people translated it like that. In German, it's called Mobus Südländer. There's also a synonym and it's called Mobus Mediterraneus. And this is actually referring to a racist stereotype of people with migration background or coming from the so-called South uh, to exaggerate their pain or to having a very high pain sensitivity. So, um, however, these findings are not statistically salient. So I cannot really say that it's always the case uh, with women and uh, or with men. But uh, they're interesting from that point of view that um, from the methodolog methodological level um, in so just not to look only on very frequent items only, but also on the items that maybe are not that um, often um, being used. And in this uh, standardized text, it, this kind of evaluative language was not really to be expected. Um, and for the second um, case study I brought, I will also just briefly, and I will also just touch briefly, I um, brought this diminutive form. Um, the diminutive uh, cystien, it is, would be translated as tiny cyst in English, and is, this is key in only FCT, so it's only key in reports on women. And um, this is something I already found in my pilot uh, study before doing this project, 
and it was found in the top 100 keywords for many uh, subcorpora. Um, and it's, it was found again in the larger data set. And it appears much more often with female than with male patients. Now, a diminutive is usually used when describing something as small or uh, maybe also as not that important. So, um, yeah, and so it was interesting to see, so I thought this might be interesting to see um, how, uh, it might be interesting to see how this uh, word form behaves and how it is being used. Um, and to study this form, I used collocates to check the context again. This is now another technique, which is often combined with the concordances I talked about before. Um, collocations are words which occur repeatedly or um, unusually often in close proximity to other words, and therefore tell us something about the meaning of a word. So I'll give you um, an example right away. Yeah, this is an image one of my colleagues created. So they were questioning, when do I write cysts or when do I, write, do I use the diminutive form, uh, little cysts or tiny cysts? Um, on this picture, again, I'm sorry, it's in German, but I'm translating it. Um, so here, there are some examples of uh, collocations. So for example, if you look at uh, cyste and you have this form unkomplizierte, so you have a, a uncompli an uncomplicated cyst, the word uncomplicated modifies the meaning of the cyst. So that's meant by um, a collocation and it occurs very often. So it's something we, um, we know it's somehow um, together or it's, it's yeah, it's uh, influencing the meaning. And I did a collocation comparison between these two words uh, to see whether there are some differences, but also similarities on whether I use the, other, the one word or the other. And some collocations are shared. You have, for example, uh, tiny cysts or big cysts and uncomplicated cysts and also uncomplicated tiny cysts. So you also have this with the diminutive form. And here you would have to add actually the inflected forms um, in German of the same, which are, many, and, and there are many of the same uh, type, kind um, again. Um, now, they often indicate the location of a cyst or the amount of cysts, the current stage of cysts. And then we find some uh, interesting, unique collocates uh, on this, at the diminutive form, which, for example, refer to the size again and indicate a sort of tininess um, twice. So you have tiniest, tiny cyst, microcystic, tiny cyst, smallest, tiny cyst, for example. So you have a sort of double uh, mitigation here. And this pattern appears more often with female patients. And so we were asking ourselves, is this does indicate an unconscious bias, for example, that women are perceived as emotionally more fragile um, and thus clinicians feel they have to filter uh, information or tone it down in some way? Um, or are there medical reasons for it? Might be that uh, cysts are in general smaller in women and therefore maybe um, this diminutive form is used. So as far as we dis discussed with um, our medical uh, project uh, partners from the radiology department, they uh, do question the usage of this uh, form um, because it has the effect that something doesn't need to be taken seriously uh, or as seriously as uh, the form cyst, and it is usually communicated differently. So they would have also the lexical choice to say uh, it's a small cyst and not a small tiny cyst. So um, this is one example of this uh, research where it had at least gave a starting point for a further discussion. And then I'm already at the end. I, I don't have uh, much more time left. Um, these are a bit general conclusions, um, but so in general, the investigated texts are largely standardized and formulaic. As I said, there are many similar text parts, and at the first glimpse, no major differences are noticeable in reports on female and uh, male patients, which is an overall positive uh, result for the radiology uh, practice and the study. So throughout my work, I did not just focus on differences, uh, but also on similarities, and you find many similarities even, I mean, also in the other case, that is where you can see that many um, patterns are the same or not that different. Uh, however, some differences can be traced by a detailed linguistic analysis, and I think corpus linguistics with a combination of this course um, analysis is really um, going well in doing so, or doing well um, uh, in 
getting there. And um, yeah, we see uh, again that the concordances show um, male and female patients are mentioned in same contexts and in same situations. And there are some instances of, of evaluative language which can be found, but they occur very rarely. So it, they cannot really clearly be attributed to one specific gender only. But it was very interesting um, to see that even in these standardized texts, there are some, um, some examples for it. A more general finding is that bias cannot easily be found on the linguistic surface of radiology reports because it might uh, occur on different levels and the data is not really spontaneous. So I think if you would have other types of texts, you might be able to find much more. But as the people are not in the center of the attention, but their body parts or um, and so on, this might not be the most uh, important category. And the texts are very um, repetitive. The standardization seems, seems to eliminate um, biases. So the last question is then, do biases maybe appear somewhere else? And this is what we're discussing currently. So might there be other practices, maybe also communicative practices, which are not documented, but uh, might point to these biases, such as um, different waiting times, for example, or the allocation of appointments. So in this way, new um, impulses at least can be generated um, uh, and have to be approached in an interdisciplinary uh, manner, which can be uh, ultimately be relevant for gender medicinal uh, research. Uh, these are the acknowledgements. And uh, thank you very much for um, listening. And I'm looking forward for, uh, to your questions. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Caroline, uh, for your uh, presentation. Uh, this was uh, really, really interesting, something in a way uh, very distant because uh, if someone is not integrated in medical research or gender medical research then obviously all these uh, aspects are, are new uh, but on the other hand I guess you showed uh, that uh, research on an interdisciplinary uh, level uh, can be uh, also created in that in that regard. So uh, I like to invite all of you uh, to my questions as Chiara uh, right before uh, announced via chat. You all are invited to make questions. Do this please uh, with the chat uh, function. Uh, Christoph, uh, in fact, uh, started with the first question uh, and uh, others are coming uh, in. So, uh, Caroline, Christoph, uh, ask. Um, thank you very much for this great talk. Is there an awareness in medicine that gender bias poses or could pose a problem? Uh, um, mm. Or does this acknowledgement come more from the outside, like feminist movements? Yeah, thank you very much, Christoph. Uh, that's a great question. Um, so there, I think it's both, <laughs> um, but our, our import, an important starting point definitely was uh, the feminist movement, uh, as in general for uh, gender studies, which we have seen also in other disciplines. I know that there is some awareness for it in Innsbruck because Innsbruck has this specific um, um, office for uh, gender medicine and there has been done some pioneer work by Margarete Hochleiter, for example, um, who has been really uh, one of the first to study different symptoms of patients um, depending on their gender. But I also know one of um, one study, uh, some of my one of my colleagues did, um, which was doing interviews in uh, niedergelassene Erz, for uh, niedergelassene Ärztinnen, so doctors here in the Tyrolean area, and they asked them. Um, they, she asked what kind of attitude they have towards gender medicine, and the outcome was not that positive. <laughs> so many of them. Um, don't think it's important or don't really see the point and so I think it's still a, a very big issue being discussed but um, yeah I mean here in Innsbruck it's it's quite established I would say but um, I think there is a, a growing awareness but there also needs to be um, done a lot for example also in medical education. Mm -hmm. Yeah thank you Caroline. 
So there are other um, questions coming in. Uh, our UNESCO uh, fellow at CAS, Alex Butzer, uh, is asking you, thank you so much for your research, Caroline. One of uh, your conclusions is that standardization eliminates bias. I was wondering about the downsizes of such standardization. Does it also eliminate the detection of gender bias diseases? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Or does, now I have to check, or does it make the detection of rare diseases more difficult? Thanks again. Uh, that's very interesting. Um, okay, so I think the, um, the elimination of uh, bias really has some downsides because you can't trace it anymore. And um, I know from the radiologists who work in this department, they say that now, um, for, this is something I didn't say in the, in the lecture, they use the speech recognition software to, to say, um, and they, um, yeah, they say the report and then the software writes it down and then they need to check if it's correct. But so it's a process which is really, there's a lot of time pressure and uh, they don't really have the time for variation. And so many maybe important informations cannot be stated anymore. This has also to do something with the structure of the text, because uh, first this was just, um, I mean, the, the, the metadata are structured, but the rest was just, I don't know, you could write anything. It was just an empty uh, box. And now you have different boxes where you put really uh, down the indication, uh, the findings, the observations, and so on. And you don't really have space for um, uh, two files per funde, so for something that you can you occasionally um, see. Um, I mean, it, I'm not sure if it eliminates the detection of gender-based diseases, because in the text you find lots of differences, um, like which exactly show these gender-based uh, diseases, or um, for example, um, yeah, symptoms that women have more often, or pain is much more often described. Chronic pain, for example, would also be a keyword in the female uh, reports. And this is something you don't get eliminated. So you get some sort of differences maybe, but it might make the detection of bias in general more difficult. Um, I think, yes, I think I would leave it like that. I hope I was clear, not sure. <laughs> yeah, thank you, yeah. Uh, Caroline. Ismaila with Ogo. Another uh, fellow at uh, Center for Advanced Studies is asking, thank you for the presentation. You showed lexical diversity text length with changes over time. Language evolves over time and medical practices change as new research and knowledge emerge. How do you proceed to make the difference when interpreting your results? Um, I have to reread again. Thank you. Yeah. So do you mean what kind of impact it has or um, what I do with the results to make mm -hmm. a difference? Yeah, I yeah. think. Yeah. Um, also ah, thank you. Imagine, yeah. Yes, I so that um, yeah. that's a very good question. Thank you, because um, this is often the problem. You do your research project and you have your data. And then once the, the project is done, you just, I think you don't uh, yeah, really engage with it anymore. And now um, what we are currently working on is guidelines. So um, the regulators have some guidelines and they have, for example, they um, should be very precise. They should use uh, a certain terminology and so on. And so we try to take this output that we got and um, at least give some impulses back and um, tell them what might be um, an issue. Um, I mean, it doesn't have to be. Also, this form of cystian uh, of the tiny cyst does not always, it, so it's not that we want to forbid something uh, because that's uh, also not really uh, going, um, yeah, it's, it's not gonna, gonna help, but it's just to raise some awareness. I think that's what we can do. And yeah, we try to um, really work interdisciplinary with them. So we always had um, a very good exchange, actually. So they, I mean, luckily they were also very interested. It could also be that if you do it for a certain, I don't know, organization that they don't like this idea of um, um, perpetuating bias through their language, but this is again, something that is not done on purpose, 
but it's really, um, yeah, it's it's um, unconsciously uh, being um, reproduced, I think. Elisa Piras, uh, hi, Caroline. Thank you for your presentation. Did you have the occasion to look at different medical documents and to observe differences in the use of language with respect uh, to gender bias? Thank you, Elisa. I would love to, but unfortunately, <laughs> I was not able. <laughs> so if you have any of them. Um, the problem is, of course, the ethical issues. Um, and you have to apply uh, at the ethical review committee. And it takes a long time until, because they don't often meet. And it's really, um, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a process. <laughs> um, and so I just applied two times, one for the pilot study and then for my for this study, I actually applied for uh, doctor's letters. So this might be um, maybe a next idea um, uh, on, on which to, on what kind of text to work, because the doctor's letters are longer. They contain reports, but they also contain other text types. And I mean, I would be extremely interested in text types which are which talk more about the patients themselves. I think um, that they're, this corpus this the discourse uh, studies approach would be really helpful because it's more easy uh, to to get some idea of what might be the problems when you have texts that are not that standardized. Yes, that would be very interesting. Yeah. Followed by Valeria. Thank you for this interesting talk. You said that the gender of the physicians was not recorded. Wouldn't that also be an interesting question, how the wording relates to the gender of those writing a text? Is there a possibility of examining the corpus uh, in this respect as well? Thank you, Valeria. Yes, that's uh, also very important. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, I was not able to encode it because of um, anonymization um, uh, efforts and uh, this is something we have not thought about <laughs> in the um, ethical when when doing this ethics uh, application, and it would be interesting, for example, to see. I mean, I thought maybe there is also some uh, difference depending on. Um, sorry, I clicked something. Uh, uh, may, maybe there's some differences in uh, the, the language used that they um, uh, have, for example, I don't know, medical terminology or Latin terms or Germanized terms, there might be some interesting phenomena. And also, for example, this hominem difficile that I mentioned, so the difficult person, this Latin term occurs, I think it's it, it's always the same person that um, that's writing down that. So there might, that would be very interesting to trace, but unfortunately it's not possible. I don't know if, if it would be possible if we would, um, apply again, but we would have to encode the whole corpus again. I don't, I don't know how time consuming it is, but uh, currently it's not possible, yes. But I totally get um, that it would be very um, important. Oh. Can you hear me? Okay, sorry. Caroline? Ah, yes, okay. I'm back. Um, I guess that we have a couple of questions uh, by uh, Katharina. Uh, now, Katharina Krepatz. Um, thank you very much for your interesting presentations. I actually have a couple of questions. First, do physicians have guidelines on wording or does it simply result uh, from the uh, nature uh, of the text? So short, informative. If there are guidelines, do they include gender aspects? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, should we start with the first uh, question and then go yes. to the next? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, thank you very much, Katarina. Um, so they have guidelines and they're, they are also being uh, discussed on an international level. So there's always new guidelines and uh, they are very interesting from a linguistics uh, point of view, because for example, they say you don't, you should not use hedges or modals or um, certain linguistic uh, um, 
items which we find that they that people often use because they might be important in this um, in the text function or somehow. So um, there are guidelines, but uh, as far as I know, they don't include gender aspects. I mean, this is something we're working on now, but uh, in general, all the other guidelines that I read through, they do not include uh, gender aspects. So this might be also an important um, issue. And uh, um, yeah, I don't know. There is no uh, example um, of guidelines, which I know. I mean, I will not have read all of them, but uh, many of them for my PhD. So um, this is not something that is being included uh, in the first place, yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, second, did you find any differences regarding descriptions of pain? Mm -hmm. In health science, we know that, for example, pain levels are assessed differently for men and women. Women's pain is ranked as less painful. So I was wondering if this was something you found in the texts. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this question. I had to leave it out to, for today, um, but I have done some work on that um, because pain uh, is also appearing as a key item in the reports on women. And there are different types of pain, for example, headache and thorax uh, pain and, and whatever. And then I was looking at the descriptions of pain and I found, one thing that I found was that, um, I mean, pain is mentioned both in, in the texts, but not as, as often as in, in women's reports. That might be because they report it more often and men are not expected to, to do so. And now what I have is the doctor's perspective. So I don't really have the, the pain description of the patient, but how this perspective is conveyed by the doctor uh, or the radiologist. And the pain, uh, so pain descriptions of women were more often uh, relativized by the form subjective, uh, subjectively. So for example, it said subjectively um, headache or subjectively um, with a diffusivity, uh, with, um, how do you say, you know, quotation marks, <laughs> um, subjectively flu-like, for example. And subjectively was some, is in, in, if you look at, at the German grammar, this subjective it is, um, it is, it can be used as a distancing marker. So um, in, for example, like a model, like uh, perhaps, or maybe, you use it to express your own um, a view towards something, some something that you say, and it is um, another thing to say it's a subjective impression of somebody than to say somebody reports on pain. And now we find that the, both men and women beklagen, um, so they uh, complain about pain, but only men do report on pain. So um, it's. It's a very subtle difference, but it can be, uh, it is measurable. So you find that um, this subjectively is only used to women. However, uh, <laughs> I also need to add, I hope I'm uh, still on time. Yes, that um, this uh, subjective um, and so there is, if you look at medical dictionaries, there is a, um, a distinction between subjective and objective symptoms. So this is not just it might be also context related. Um, so subjective symptoms are something that I experience and objective is something, for example, if I see uh, an, an open fracture or something like that. And so I checked also for um, occurrences of objective. So for example, objective, um, I don't know, um, bleeding or fracture or whatever. And this did almost never appear in these CTs. This was again, a whole body CTs that I checked. And so, there was uh, a slight difference that was um, measurable. And um, yeah, um, I think that's, that's the most important on this uh, for this mm -hmm. question, yes. And there is a final uh, methodological question. How ah. many tokens, texts do you need to be able to conduct such a study? Is there a minimum amount? Uh, yes, thank you. That's a very tricky question and it's uh, being discussed a lot because there is no rule actually. Um, so in the, in the in the beginning of corpus linguistics, you always wanted to get bigger corpora and I mean something that I did, I compiled a really big corpus. But now um, 
there are also uh, discussions about well, um, so if if it's a very large corpus, then what? Uh, so you have many frequent items. What do they really say? So there is a current discussion, and some uh, some. I mean, it's really depending on the research question. Some research questions might be easily answered with smaller data sets. So you could also just use I don't know uh, thousands of these one thousand of these reports and also find out something uh, important. Um, it was usually it was this the bigger the better, but now we are seeing uh, that this is not always the case. It's really depending on what you want to do and what uh, what your interests are in. Um, yes. So I'd, I'm, I would not say that there is a minimum amount. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Caroline. Uh, next question by Michael de Rachevils. Terrific project. Thank you, Caroline. I was wondering, is there a difference in numbers between MMRI and CT examinations in women and men? For example, are physicians more hesitant to expose women to exams that use x-rays? Oh, I have to, I will have to write that question down. Thank you. Uh, I can't answer it for the moment. I would have to check. Um, mm -hmm. I know, mm -hmm. I mean, what is really being discussed is uh, mammography now, um, because if you leave away all the mammographies, the the then the, the this uh, difference between the amount of reports is really really large. So and it's strange because I mean there are these gender specific diseases and um, behaviors maybe that lead to certain um, certain um, uh, states. But uh, yeah, it seems to be. Um, it's it's not really clear why why this is the case. So thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to check on that one. Elisa has another question. Did you look at the corpus from an intersectional uh, point of view to see whether gender bias are paired with ageist, ableist, or other biases? Yes, that was my idea, <laughs> Elisa. Thank you. But mm -hmm. I. Uh, I was really, it, it's really difficult to work um, from an intersectional uh, perspective. For example, I tried to look at uh, the type of insurance, which I think was would be a very interesting category to look at, maybe also in relation to gender. But then I found, for example, that there is um, some problems in the data. So you don't really, it's always uh, saying uh, that there is a private insurance, which definitely is not the case in 5 million uh, texts, but uh, there, seems to be so the, the metadata are usually just ticked at the at the top of this uh, software and uh, then this seems to be a default setting for example so they often are not even there and um, that was one problem that I faced and um, and I really don't have a solution um, a specific uh, idea on how to uh, to approach this because yeah, the data provide several uh, problems, but uh, in general, of course, many other factors would have to be taken into account. I mean, one example from the metadata would be that I found that some patients are mentioned as asylum seekers um, in their occupational um, in an occupational category. So, where in my case, it would say a linguist or uh, whatever, you have asylum seekers. So there are some instances of where also the other social factors are very. <clears throat> important and influence the report. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, again, uh, Katharina, you also mentioned racist stereotyping, the Moro Südländer. Is this something that you are also interested in further investigating? Do intersectional perspectives play a role? Thank you. Yes, uh, I have already uh, been talking about this with a um, doctor from uh, Brunek. <laughs> From the clinic, and she said that there is has been a study at the Claudiana in Bozen, which tried to look at whether um, the so whether I think the pain uh, the pain medication it was do Italians or uh, Italian tourists I'm, I'm not sure again uh, receive less or receive more um, pain medication than uh, Germans, and uh, I think this would be very uh, interesting. Uh, to look at uh, maybe also with uh, different languages. I don't know if that's uh, that might be a, a too big idea, but uh, yeah, 
um, it would definitely be very interesting to look at this um, from other angles and uh, with different perspectives. Thank you. So slowly, slowly coming to an end. Uh, we have uh, three questions, two by Cas uh, Cohet, uh, Roland Benedicta, at the University of Innsbruck, but also in all other similar contexts, there is a huge systemic and long-term offensive in introducing artificial intelligence into medicine at all levels. All experts predict that this will generate major transformation of the sector over the coming years. What do you expect by the AIification of medicine with regard to the gender dimension? Will it help to reduce or rather blow up bias and so on? Thank you. That's a very interesting uh, question. So I, I'm not sure because uh, from what I see um, and on from the current discussions on chat, chat uh, GPT and so on, you see that ultimately the data these um, AIs work with are um, not always just computer generated, but they are also human generated. And you see lots of biases if you look at them from a gender specific uh, point of view. And so it might even uh, uh, inflict this bias again, I think. Um, and I mean, there are many studies from the uh, NLP uh, sector, for, so from natural language processing on this topic, which um, are getting uh, also in a similar direction. And they, for example, can also work with lots with large data sets, and they usually have something they look at. So, uh, for example, they look at certain diffusivity markers or modals or so on, and they uh, they try to de detect a bias with the training of the data themselves. So this is a very interesting field, and I think it would be really good to bring uh, linguistics a bit closer to uh, to to NLP and and the other way around, but. I see that there is some, still some borders, I think, to uh, really get across uh, disciplinary uh, work. But um, I think that would be very uh, important in the future. Yes, definitely. Finally, what is the role of the World Health Organization in all this, given that it is, as all global bodies, currently increasingly torn between open and authoritarian societies, with the latter not that much interested in gender equality? Okay, that's a really tough one. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, gender equality itself is a big um, topic that has to be discussed more broadly, I think. And um, I mean, the only thing we can do, I think, is, or yeah, the, the role would be to uh, to raise awareness, I think, and to uh, continue discussing at least. So, because one just has to, even has to start with uh, having an idea that this might not be really equal. So this is, uh, yeah, on a on a large societal level, I think it would need um, more changes and more uh, and a, a debate on this, and not just. Uh, um, uh, people who are against it or uh, yeah <laughs> but this would be a very uh, unknown discussion I think yes yeah the last question from uh, the chat uh, by Miriam uh, Gruber thank you very much for your fascinating presentation I was wondering if you or maybe somebody else in your faculty or research team works with deep learning techniques for example artificial neuronal network analysis to analyze such big data, or in other words, are deep learning techniques a thing that uh, Uni Innsbruck in ling linguistic studies? Um, thank you. Um, that's also a very good question. Now, I have not worked with that. Um, and at the linguistics department there, um, I mean, this, this is something that is being, um, it, I mean, it's a topic, but uh, it's not really um, it's not really a focus on our department. So um, we have people who know uh, who, who want to get uh, um, more in this in this area, but usually we don't really do uh, a lot with uh, neural networks um, as uh, for today. 
but um, it would be very interesting. I mean, the problem with, we try to work, for example, I mean, it's not the same, but we try to work with machine learning. And the problem was that the data was German, for example. So the, that's already an obstacle because uh, most of the tools are trained for English data and you would have to annotate a lot of things uh, on your own and see how it goes and then again, um, inter uh, annotate. So uh, yeah, this is, um, is definitely something um, interesting, but it's not. Uh, I have, so I have not worked with this um, at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Carolina, in, in a way, a concluding uh, question by me directly. So we at the beginning uh, of this discussion talked about interdisciplinary research. All in all, what is your experience with interdisciplinary research? Uh, would you call this interdisciplinary research and in what way? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that's um, something I thought about a lot in the last years. Uh, and I, uh, I really have to say that I, um, I really enjoyed this work because there are many things that uh, from a linguistics perspective, you can't really know. I mean, I am by no means a medical expert. So uh, we always had to uh, check with them and exchange. And it really brought new perspectives to me. At times I had the feeling that we're talking about something similar, but with other words, or I don't know, in a different manner. So it was really, um, it was actually the only way uh, to go for this project because um, yeah, we would not uh, have even, uh, gotten the data or we would not be have we wouldn't had this idea also so it was really important from the beginning now at some times uh, i saw that uh, uh, the disciplines are um yeah so when they are open i think you both of them can can learn from each other and um yes yeah, so in the end it's um it's at least helping you in or it is helping you in getting a bit of a fuller picture i think and yes, I, uh, I really, really like this collaboration, but also because they were very interested in linguists, in linguistics. So it was uh, really a, a mutual um, interest that was really, really good. Yeah, Caroline, a wonderful presentation, fascinating presentation, great questions and wonderful, uh, very good, deep uh, answers. I think this is the summary of this hour uh, we experienced together with you. Uh, really interesting uh, research questions, uh, which opens our minds uh, for sure. Uh, I have also in the name of uh, co-head of Center for Advanced Studies, Roland Benedict, to say thank you very much to you. Uh, you as a part of the team, uh, as a global fellow, I have to thank you, uh, all those who made these uh, great questions. Special thanks to uh, Chiara Paris and Elisa Piras, but also Valeria von Miller and uh, Elena Rigi, our communication team, uh, for uh, preparing uh, this uh, lecture. And uh, well, uh, thank you very much again, and all the best. Thank you.